Welcome to the Ages of Rock podcast with your hosts, Bill Algy, Dennis Talbot, and Alan Tate. We are three guys who have one thing in common, a love of rock and roll. Our goal is to talk about all things rock. We hope you find this show intriguing, funny, and occasionally highly opinionated. Enjoy. Welcome back to the Age of Rock podcast. It's Bill and Alan. We're just a duo tonight. Our buddy Dennis has, I don't know, flood or something like that going on at in-law, so he's got to do something else. But I've got two dudes here that Jorge, I don't know, but Chris Boss, he's a badass. I'm telling you right now. So it's uh, we're glad to have him on there. Um, this is episode number 256. Um, where have you been for 256 episodes, Chris Boss? I was just wondering that. Why did it take you so long to get me on? <laughs> oh, you're blaming me? <laughs> Man, how quickly they turn on you. <laughs> I blame myself. No, man, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure. Now, a little story. So Chris and I met, it's got a man, it's probably been five years ago, six, seven years ago, long time ago. Um, his band, uh, played a gig um for a company called shimatsu that makes imaging equipment and um i think that i don't know when the first time you played for them but but they he they became the band like people would not go to the shimatsu party if chris wasn't playing and i know that for a playing. Fact. i want to clarify was not playing yeah if he was not okay. playing they would not go okay yeah so if so I remember the last time we saw the last time we saw you play, which was in, uh, I don't remember where that was. Was that in Nashville? No, it wasn't Nashville. I can't remember where the last time it was, it might but the last Vegas. time, sorry. It may have been in Vegas, but I'm not sure. May have, been, may have been, I don't remember. Anyway, whenever it was, um, I don't know if you know this or not, but people were stealing the tickets. So really? like you had to have a special ticket to go to the show because uh-huh. they only had so many, they only had so much room and um, people would somebody, I know somebody had left their tickets on a, on a table in the back to go give somebody else their ticket, another set of tickets that they'd gotten for them. And somebody stole their tickets when they left. I know, if, I know that happened for a few people. So you were, a, you were, you were a hot ticket, dude. <laughs> a hot ticket stolen, even at, at all they were costs. stealing your tickets. Yeah, that's, that's cool. I'm going to, you know, I have a list of like things, you know, that are uh, important, you know, to things I've done in my career, you know, like I've opened for this person, you know, I played here. People have stolen my tickets to my shows. Add that that's to your list. Worthy of <laughs> mentioning. Terrific. Like it really is. Yeah. 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 <laughs> definitely it, it is true and it almost it almost became a fight because somebody ended up figuring out who it was and i thought there was going to be like a uh yeah. a brawl. people a brawl. have bled because of my music that, that's Could have been. you always have to strive yeah. yeah is that what you strive for bleeding for the yeah you know you just got to go for whatever you can strive for violence so i know you said you've played for a whole bunch of people so look you know we're going to talk about you got a new record coming out but talk, talk a little bit about kind of how you got started in music and Mm -hmm. And kind of, you know, I know that you've played for a variety of folks and um, Uh opened and you play for the Spurs and do all kinds of really cool stuff. So tell us about that. I've been lucky just to, for a knucklehead that just likes to play guitar, you know, to, to figure things out over, you know, the course of many years. But, you know, I started um, just playing guitar and I figured out at an early age what I really wanted to do. Like, it's just, you know, when I, when I had that vision you know, everything, all the struggles seem to like be far less than they would be if you're still kind of on the fence. And and that's true with anything. I just decided like, I'm going to do this, you know, and and I'm, I'm just going to do it no matter what, like, I'm probably going to be broke. I'm probably gonna, you know, come into some hardships. I'm not going to have my nice things like a lot of people have, and I'm okay with that. Um, so yeah, I started early and then, um, I entered a uh, Battle of the Bands competition. It was a junior Battle of the Bands competition. And I had never played a gig before. And um, it's funny that um, we didn't have any recording equipment. And this, I'll date myself, but you remember those shoebox recorders with like the record button on one end? Did you have one of those and a big yeah. round speaker on it and had a cassette player? I had, you know, a couple of buddies in, in my garage and, you know, I pressed record and we just, you know, blazed through some stuff we were working on and submitted it to the uh, 
to the, the competition and we got a call back and uh, said, congratulations, you know, we need to, to uh, you know, you've made the cut and you're going to be one of five bands performing that day and we'll need you to perform like 45 to an hour's worth of music. So we like high fived and then it was like immediate, like stress because we're like, <laughs> oh shit, what are we going to do for that long? We just kind of learned a few things. So uh, as a result of that, uh, you know, I was a little terrified, I'll be honest, but I had a lot of, you know, music inside me. I was ready to get out at that point. I was kind of a late bloomer as far as performing live. And so when I did, I actually won Best Guitarist from that. And the company that sponsored that offered me a job full time teaching as a music instructor. So that led to me meeting a lot of people and starting to um, do some like studio recording, uh, some live road work. I joined a band that, you know, was like a regional kind of touring act and things just kind of sort of snowballed from there. You know, I started playing a uh, you know, country music. I, I was like, I'm obviously a, a rock guitar player, but at that point, after being so stubborn and hard headed and not really making any money from music, I just kind of followed like, is, does this gig pay? Is this is a paying gig. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm in for that. So I kind of just said yes to anything that was a paying gig and started buying equipment and gear and, uh, you know, from then I started playing uh, some some cover bands. I um, uh, let me backtrack. Before I started playing in cover bands, I was still writing and recording uh, original music. I had a couple of bands that I was with, um, and some of which went on to like you know uh, do some opening slots for some like reputable um, artists. There's one that you may have heard of uh, called Kiss. I believe it is. I don't, I've never heard of them. I don't I believe they're called Kiss. I'm not sure. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but um, they're both huge Kiss fans, by the way. And um, that to me, yeah. I mean, opening for Kiss is to this day, you know, if not the most proudest achievement, it's 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 up there. You know, uh, performing the national anthem for the Spurs was after that. But I had some of the, you know, I was in two different bands. One was called As Is, the other one was called Snake Dance. We opened for Kiss. We opened for a lot of bands that were either, I always tell people, were either kind of rising up to fame or falling from the stars. And they were in that club level, you know, which um, was great for us because it fell right in their lap. You know, we're going to open for these like hair bands or whatever it was. I got to open for Steve Vai when he was on the, oh, uh, cool. uh, what tour was that? But so um, we had Dreads. The yeah. Passion and Warfare. Was it Passion uh, and Warfare? Or what was the other Sex one? and Religion. I think. Sex and Religion. The one yeah. with the dreads. Yes. And he had uh, he had the, the guitar player, that's that singer. What's his name? That we used to use as presets on. Uh, Dave. No, not Dave. Uh, oh, Townsend? Devin, Devin Townsend? Devin Townsend was on was Singing on? Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. And they were doing like a full rock band. And so, you know, these little things like opening for Steve I, like, oh my God, opening for Kiss. It was just incredible, you know, and things were trending the right direction. And then a band came out called Nirvana. You may have heard of. Killed it. Bastard. Changed everything. <laughs> <laughs> Completely. So it was at that point that I started playing cover music, playing some country music. A lot of the music that was coming out was not fulfilling for me. Or, or rewarding in any way there was no chops going on i still wanted to you know shred i guess and i heard some of these country guitar players i'm like oh my god this is shred but in like a different way shred with so, a twang you know, i never played country at that time i um you know i got i got yeah i got a, a dose of you know i got my ass handed to me by when i was trying to learn this stuff that i kind of overlooked and thought was just kind of really simple simple kind of stuff so all those kind of things shaped um i guess you know my direction and where i'm at now um i, I was you know after that released uh three full albums uh well two full albums and an ep all of which are on itunes so and other places of just all original material one of them was a little blues based um the other one was i guess a little more like a modern rock um, and then the third one, 
I did with my partner Jorge here with um, was a instrumental EP, just guitar music. Yeah, and I listened so to that today. Actually, it was really it was very it was very interesting. I liked it a lot. It was really good. You know, it's yeah. it's interesting you talk about the shift to country because we were just talking about that right before really? we got on, right get on the air. We were talking about because Dennis, who's not with us tonight, he was. We were talking about um, Alan's playing some music in a country band and we were kind of talking about just that whole shift and you know what we like and what we don't like and new country and old country and stuff like that and I mm -hmm. you know I, I had just told him that that back in the 90s you know the eight in the late 80s early 90s when you know hair metal and 80s metal all just died and Nirvana came in I just left I mean I just checked the shit out of of rock music I went straight to country and and it yeah. was because I didn't want to be depressed and everything I was hearing on the radio and all the new music was just making me want to just, oh my God, it's just depressing as hell. And um, yep. to your point, you know, went went to listen to Vince Gill and Keith Whitley and those guys and, and you know, some, you know, just ridiculous playing and stuff. So uh, it's just interesting that that, that, that you know, kind of parallels what we were talking about just right before the show. I mean, it was literally minutes. That's totally <laughs> true. And Vince Gill, Vince Gill, I thought, you know what? Okay, so this guy's not like a typical, like, hee-haw cornball with a nacho hat on, you know, with like, you know, that kind of country is, it. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, let me back up. When I listen to country, like, if I'm on a, like a road trip or something, I listen to all kinds of stuff. Sometimes I want to hear like some old, old, like, just basic, classic country. Um, But, you know, as far as like the musicianship, mm -hmm. like, right now country music probably i mean as far as the mainstream you know of course you have you know all these other you know um like styles you know that of course showcase incredible musicianship but as far as like you know people the, the record buying country uh, public they probably don't know how good the musicians are on those records because they outsource i think from so many places so many session musicians and well, it's a little circle of most of it happening in Nashville, but all those dudes are insane players and yeah. nobody knows because, because they don't need to be insanely playing on everything. Yeah. But that's the like, best Brad, part. Right. You got exceptions like Brad Paisley. Right. 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 Keith Urban, I feel is a Brent great Mason. player. Yeah, for sure. Brett Mason, of course, he's not like a singer necessarily. So guitar players know Brett Mason, um, but you uh record buying public may know oh cool he's the one that did the chatty hoochie thing on alan jackson's record <laughs> yeah he did all kinds of stuff so we you know any rock player with guitar player or musician with good sense has a high uh you know yeah we'll, we'll also we'll put people like brad paisley and, and all that within right next to people like you know like a like a steve i or somebody like that i mean i would i would in their essence you know what i mean yeah. it's like they're of the same caliber mm -hmm. you know even though as different as they might be yeah that's yeah, really interesting I, to your point about keith urban i mean i could just listen to keith urban just play i just like listening to him just play it's just amazing some of the stuff that he does but yeah and it's it's kind of funny because you know we we know um from doing the podcast and stuff like that we know a lot of the guys from the you know the 80s scene and stuff they all moved to nashville there's a ton of those guys live in Nashville and it's so ironic <laughs> yeah. that that's where those guys have all moved to. And, you yeah. know, the bar, and when you go into, you know, you can go to some of the clubs and stuff like that. And you see these guys that you see playing a rock gig one night and the next night they're playing in a country band. And the next night, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. And, you know, session players, like you said, that end up, you know, you don't, they don't get a lot of notoriety, but they end up being, a, you know, the guy that goes out on tour with, you know, Carrie Underwood or whoever. And then, uh -huh. you know, they come back and then they're playing in their rock band because the one makes, you know, you're making money on the one and the other one, you're just doing it because you, you got time and you're playing with your buddies and, you know, it's just, it's just a different environment, but. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah I've always amazing. kind of done that, you know, try to um, balance, you know, both. Uh, you know, in my early in my career, I was just all in on it, on my my music, you know, uh, and then I completely sold out. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> no, I just I had to figure out like a lot of guys, you know, you either evolve, I guess, or you get left behind. And I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, playing other genres, doing, you know, session work. You know, most 
most um, pro musicians, I mean, if you want to consider yourself a pro, I mean, you're going to earn a living from it. And so if you're just pouring your heart and soul into original music and nobody's buying music, you know, what else do you do? If you're really determined to play music for a living, make it work, you know, mm -hmm. make it work, whatever that takes. And um, so how's the, how's the COVID stuff? You know, I know that in Texas, how did that affect you? I mean, was it, were, were you guys shut down from gigs for a long period of time or were you, cause I've seen you, I mean, I, I, I follow you. So I see that you've got gigs going on, you know, still yeah. periodically at clubs or whatever. So how, how far, how long were you down? Was it, were you, in, were you down quite a while? I mean, me personally, um, you know, it, it goes through, you go through a period where the bar is completely shut down. Everyone's in panic mode. I mean, that's across the nation, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to shake anybody's hand or go to the store. Everybody's buying toilet paper. Did you guys, I mean, oh, yeah. It was all, oh, yeah. losing their minds. Yeah. And, I don't know uh, what they, I don't know what they thought was going to happen. I don't, I mean, <laughs> why? I could never figure out why toilet paper. <laughs> Uh, it could be anything. It could be toothpaste, Q-tips, like toilet paper. And then, you know, like, like we're all sheeple, right? So, oh, oh yeah. Look at that guy. Look, we're getting kind of low on this aisle. Like, he got two. Maybe I should get like three or four. And then <laughs> somebody sees that guy. And they're like, here we go. But thankfully, I did not run out of toilet paper. Um, <laughs> That's, yeah, we did fine. But you, you're yeah, a kid, right? I have a bidet. Huh? I have a yeah, bidet. bidet. Okay. Cool. You know, it's good, funny. Bidet. Well, actually, I think Dennis put a bidet in. Didn't Dennis went and put a Dennis, bidet. Yeah, Dennis, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He put a bidet in. He's like, I'm not. He's like, I'm like buying all that damn toilet paper. I'm just gonna put it. And he did. He put a bidet in. So it's like, oh. whatever. I mean, for me, at the end of, of the bidet, it's really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I didn't run out. Thankfully. That's good. Yeah, it was it was a complete shutdown of the bars, and um, my my wife is a is a PA um, and was doing telemedicine, treating COVID patients through, you know, Zoom calls and and FaceTime. So you know, she was working with a company that went from doing house calls and uh flu and you know that kind of stuff to like exploding through the roof with covid um patients and so the the threat of covid and the realism of covid is very prevalent in my house it still is um so even when things started opening up there was still a question of like well do i want to go play do i want to go out in public and perform so I started to be selective about the places that I was going to go perform and opted for outdoor venues. And, you know, now that the weather's sort of turning, there's a lot more opportunity, but it was a good solid year for me of like completely nothing. Is it, okay. And you use that time to write the, that, the newest record then? Is that when I you wrote it. that? I used, yeah. it, I used it creatively, but, you know, like to touch on like what we just, what I just outlined as far as my career once I figure out, you know, how to like earn a living and stuff, you know, I've landed some, some really like great consistent, you know, gigs. Like I would play every Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, like sometimes doubling up with like, I do an acoustic show or I go, you know, play a private event during the week, like on a Tuesday in Nashville or Vegas or wherever. So th those kind of things kept me, you know, running on that little wheel happily but for a very long time. And so when this thing happened and it shut things down, I was like a little awkward. And then it just started feeling really nice to not, it just took so long to feel like I can just like, I can just sit here and do nothing. Like I don't have anything to do. And so, you know, I have my son who's seven. I mean, he's, he's just, you know, he's, he's my prize in life. He's my most, you know, I'm so proud to be his dad. And we have such an incredible relationship that I got to really dig in and just really have some fantastic family time. So that's cool. really what I use most of it for was to like step away from music, um, step into, you know, a different role. He started going back to school online. So 
I was able to be here with him. So I just enjoyed all that stuff so much, so much of that time. And then, you know, all that kind of starts, you start always kind of coming back to what makes you whole, you know, like where, what kind of person you really are. So of course music, you know, slowly started creeping in and um, it, I just miss playing music so much. And so now that things are coming back, playing more live gigs, um, we're, putting some finishing touches of some of the other stuff that we already had pieced together for this album that COVID prevented us from releasing in, in on our timeline that we had originally chosen. So. so talk about the new record then. So it's called Moon Chaser, right? Well, so Moon Chaser is a single. Is the single, okay. Which was released from this group of tracks that were originally intended for a full album. So we decided to change the idea of releasing a full album mm -hmm. to just releasing a single at a time because we thought people need music well, right now. That and there's also the, the fact that there's so many people that are releasing music right now mm -hmm. that, well, a couple of things. There's that. There's a lot, everyone's kind of releasing music right now that everything's kind of starting to open back up and people are starting to get back into the routine but then also um just the times uh because of streaming and all of these other things full albums the attention span of someone whether you release a full album or a single will be the same for both so if you release a 12 song album people are going to be like great that's awesome i love the album and then just kind so of move on to the next, to even though else. there's like 12 songs there, you know, it's like still kind of like, it, it's looked at as one whole, as one thing. Mm -hmm. And then it, and then it, and then people move on. So I think the, a little bit more of a better strategy for nowadays is people have just been really kind of concentrating on singles. Um, and the advantage to that is that it gives you a little bit of, you don't have to like write, everything all at once and then have have it all ready and then label and labels and this and that and it's like you can start to build slowly and you can take your time with everything because everything also needs visual now as well because of covid um covid kind of uh brought the the visual aspect to a lot of things people are now streaming and um and all of that so it's just kind of a in our opinion it's a bit of a better strategy to where if we have 12 songs to release let's not all release them all at once and really take our time with them make sure that we're happy with everything and get other people involved get other uh video artists or you know cover art artists and or col of, collaborate with other musicians as well right 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 which is yeah. something that we tried to do so i mean who knows like it's possible that on your third release um maybe that uh, someone becomes available or, you know, like sort of, you know, blows across their radar and sort of build things like that. But I know a lot of artists are releasing full albums, like still, you know, I personally miss the old days of like having a release date and mm -hmm. you had to go to the record store and you had to wait in line and there was like all this buzz and you get it and you get that cellophane off there and you, you smell it and you look at it and you feel it, hold it, open it up. And oh, you just sit there and you put it on and you look at the kiss like alive too. And there's like, like you're there, you're with that band in that moment because of all the visual stuff. But yeah, to your point, I mean, it's true. People want that visual stimulation too. So um, that's one thing that we intend to do is um, that we may not be able to do if you release a full album is to release a video with every song that we release too. So a little, a bit more content that way. It's just sort of spread out. Well, I'm curious, um, have you thought about if you do do an album to do vinyl? You know, if you thought about, cause, and it's, it's so, it's so popular right now. It is, it's made such a huge comeback. And now it's, it's funny that like you can get vinyl but they have a USB out. So you can like Bluetooth it to your like, whatever it's like, it is vinyl though. It yep. is like technology. It's isn't that funny? Like what it what technology does to us? You know, we get so spoiled and it's the new thing, but then after a while we're like, but wait a second. Wasn't it 
wait, I, I liked that. I liked the old way. Like I used to do things like that. I kind of feel like that's true even with like rock and roll and, and music itself, you know, like, oh, wow, this sounds, this sounds even better. Like, and look at all this technology. We can make everything sound so perfect. And then you listen to like Kiss or like, I don't know, Deep Purple or like Thin Lizzy came on the other night when I was playing at the club. I'm like, what is it about this band that is just so badass? It's just, it's not perfect, yeah, but it's, it's just, just raw. clean and like just raw, but it's, it's, it's perfect, but it doesn't sound polished in a perfect way. So yeah, but all those things, you know, I mean, you know, humanity is just <laughs> constantly evolving, you know, and sometimes regressing, you know. Yeah, I, I definitely, I, I definitely agree. I mean, I think that, that, um, you know, it's, it's good musically to stretch and grow and stuff like that, but going back to the roots sometimes is, is, uh, you, you just, you just bring back that feeling, you know, I, I'm sitting here looking at my turntable right now and it's because I haven't played I have, right next to that is my C are the 400 and some odd CDs that I have. And now I have 400 and some odd LPs and uh. you know, it's, it's, it's because I, and I don't, if I listen to music, I listen to it on my iPod in the like mowing and, you know, out in the yard or whatever. But if I'm in the house listening to something, it's on vinyl and it's only been like that for the last couple of years. And it, it's just because it just feels, and I think at least for, you know, that some of us are a little older, <laughs> it feels like home. It feels, you know, it, you just, it takes you back to that time. And then we would talk about it on, you know, talk about that on here a lot that, that's what music does. If you bring, you know, it's emotional and it's, uh, you know, it, it brings back memories and thoughts and it you know, takes you to places that you, that you either miss or that you really enjoyed. And sometimes places that you don't ever want to go back to. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. I get songs that I hear and I'm like, man, it's just like, I, I can remember exactly where I was the first time I heard that. It's just crazy. And it, it's got like, it goes deep, you know, mm -hmm. and depending on where you are and who's around, like if I'm if I'm on a long stretch of highway, which is actually, you know, we'll get back to Moon Chaser here in a little bit, but if I'm on like a long stretch of highway, I've already played the gig. My son is nowhere around, my wife is at home. It's just me, just me and the road and the moon. And that's how we kind of sort of that's came up with that idea exactly how they came up for yeah. that song because those little moments are are pretty powerful. You do a lot of can't help but think right when you're mm -hmm. out there just right. you think differently when you're alone on the road and there's no one around it's pitched back and it's so that's that was kind of the inspiration for that song moon chaser that we wrote um and the song title i think is was described you know that i tried to describe it is that you know like when we play music when we perform music you know with with small exception there's it's it's done at night right and so you're you're with not, with that moon that moon is um just looks like the muse right it is it's, it's like kind of like it's always present whether you're inside or you're outside but at the time of night the moon's always present when you're making music mm -hmm. and so it's sort of like the vibe behind you know uh that uh, well, and also night nighttime itself is is a is a can be a very solitary, you know. Even mm -hmm. like you could be hanging out at a club and still be the most lonely person, you know what I mean? And and it's it's a nighttime is is a is a time when like anything could happen. Like during the day, every the, the normal stuff happens during the day. Everyone takes care of whatever it is that they take care of. Mm -hmm. Nighttime comes along, and then you're a different person. Right. And in, oh, in yeah. us included in the sense <laughs> of like, I mean, you know, you, your dad and everything during the day, but when you're on stage, you're Chris boss. And that's like, that's a completely, even though, even though all of every, all of your family and everything is still very much so a part of you, you're a different person when you're on stage because you have power over people, you know, you have like, you can make people feel things that, that normally they wouldn't then that's why they're there you know it's like they're either there to forget about something they're there to meet somebody they're there to like 
hang out, relax, get up, but you, it's their emotional state is very much so in your hands. Mm -hmm. And so that, all of that, the moon kind of does that as, as well, you know, and people look at the, there's like, people can use the moon as sort of like the, the original, the original title was Texas moonshine. And I think it was kind of because we were talking about sort of like a bit of a play on moonshine, like the, but, more so on the sense that it's intoxicating in the sense that the moonshine like the moon's there when you're when you're performing when you're driving it's like your 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 friend you know mm -hmm. and so for you to be chasing the nightlife and chasing this like sort of power you're chasing the moon right and so that's it made perfect sense to me when when you told me about the change you know it was it, it encompasses the the feeling of of uh of that the lonely road warrior going mm -hmm. out and 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 doing his thing you know yeah there's been times when i'm going to the gig right and i'll just you know i won't, I won't have my mind on on it at all and i'll just look up and i'll be like oh shit <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it's like a full like crazy one <laughs> like, yeah, i'm already going to this crazy bar full moon it was wasn't a full moon yesterday i think or it was it's, yeah it was it's been a full yeah it's been a full moon last couple yeah, of days so. yeah over the weekend yeah, we don't really claim to be too deep into like you know interplanetary. So you're all astrology into astrology, <laughs> but it's just we can't help it. Sometimes you're just driving, you're like, "Wow, look at that! It's just so powerful," you know. And then we start, you know, thinking you know, about how prevalent it is, you know, and how, like you said, the moon oh, the moon affects the tides. I mean, it has to be able to affect things other than water. You know, and I have family that works in the emergency room and they say every full moon, you know it because the place is just insane. Yeah, yeah I, can, I can tell you it was this weekend. I did the numbers Monday for, for our department <laughs> over the weekend. I can tell you that it was, it was this weekend. <laughs> you can see it in the volumes for sure. Well, and it's also something that's bigger than ourselves, right? We sort of take it for granted because it's there as part of the scenery but then when you when you really kind of think about it it's another it's a complete it's part of us you know and it's like be, the tides wouldn't move and everything else that the moon does to earth we we would not exist as a species if the relationship was not perfect mm -hmm. you know what i mean and so we sort of take it for granted but it's it's a nice anchor it's a nice anchor to have you know as far as like you're on earth earth has one moon you know and that's like that's it still blows my mind when I think that we we landed on that shit. Like, are you kidding? Me? <laughs> <laughs> we, we took a vessel up there. So it was like somehow oh, safely yeah. landed, and people walked on, it and we flew back. That still blows my mind. Yep. Did it really happen? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or did it? Or, 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 or did, did it? it. Or did it. So, they say. <laughs> so they say. That's right. So speaking of things that blow your mind, I saw that you have played the Star Spangled Banner for the San Antonio Spurs. Tell us how uh, that happened. Um, so a guy that worked for the Spurs happened to be at one of my shows a long time ago. And I, uh, actually, he worked for the San Antonio Rampage, the now, our now defunct um, ice hockey team who was owned at that time by spurs sports and entertainment and he said uh hey would you be interested in playing performing the national anthem for like a hockey game i was like are you kidding of course i would love to do that i've always wanted to do that he goes well let me check on it and see what how i can do that so uh he said he called me back you know surprisingly a lot of these club like discussions end with somebody waking up like what happened last night everything we talked about is gone i've had a lot of that in my life but this guy he, he called and he said um so i figured it out so the way we do it is we we give you a stack of tickets and and you help us promote um your performance and the game um and uh you know you sell these tickets and then we have you perform okay cool so i went down to the arena picked up my stack of tickets uh gave the guy a handshake um and then you know I, I went around asking people if they wanted to buy it here in texas let me remind you if they wanted 
to buy tickets for ten dollars to go see a hockey game and <laughs> nobody <laughs> wanted to do that at all so i kept asking and then after like i started getting clinically depressed i just gave up um it wasn't clinically it, it was, was self-diagnosed was i just got a stack of tickets <laughs> yeah just sitting there i had the exact same i was just like i'm not asking people anymore i already know they're gonna tell me no it's just sad <laughs> so i um the guy called me and said hey so we're about a week out how's it going you know going great and excited so how many of these tickets do you think i need to sell he's like oh, well how many have you sold i go i don't i mean i don't really remember but what's the minimum you would say I would need to sell? It's like, I don't know. I mean, nobody's asked me that. Uh, 30? Yeah, it's about, let me see, I did a quick math. It's about what I sold. Yeah, about 30. Like, oh, 300 bucks was a lot. So, yeah, I took, them, I took 30 tickets out, you know, kept them as a souvenir. I really should have kept them. I didn't. I threw them away. And I took the other stack to the guy and gave him 300 bucks out of my wallet. Here you go. And it's awesome. All right. You're all set up. So, yeah, I went out there uh, on a red carpet in, the, in this giant arena, with all these people and uh, played my version of the national anthem. And they loved it. They loved it. And they asked me back um, and they said, you know what? Don't worry about the ticket thing. They just want you to, to get in and do your thing. And it's like, awesome. OK, cool. I don't have to Finally. pay to do this again. Finally. Yeah. And so then it was shortly after that, that the Spurs contacted me directly and wanted me to do the, that uh, at the AT&T center for a playoff game. And that was the beginning of good things with the Spurs. Um, and so since then I've, I've performed the national anthem. So that first performance was in 2008 for the Spurs. Wow. So that was a sold out crowd then. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah it was playoff game. I'm sure it was sold out for sure. That was that was at the at the when the Spurs were in their prime when they had like mm -hmm. Tim Duncan and Jan Oh, yeah. so another funny thing, really quick. I gotta always tell people about this one. So imagine being out there by yourself with your guitar, just thinking to yourself, "Don't screw it up. Don't screw it up. Don't screw it up. Whatever you do, don't fall. Don't trip. Don't hit a bad note. Don't leave out a verse. All that stuff." And and the announcer and the house lights go down and the announcer comes over this big PA and says, and now bring your attention to center court for the presentation of the sixth man of the year award presented to Monty Ginobili. And it's just, what? I, I didn't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> and they presented him with an award. It was the sixth man of the year, which you know is, you yeah. know, is, is an award given to you know there's five players yeah guy the, off the first guy off the bench roster yeah. somebody comes off the bench he he won that award and nobody told me about that so there's um my buddy <laughs> sent me a picture from nba.com of him holding up this thing and i'm in the background like <laughs> like what <laughs> <laughs> so, Not doing it yet, dude. and then and now and then yeah, and so then that happened. So, but my my relationship with the Spurs has has really developed over the years to the point where uh, I performed the national anthem for them probably at least twice a year. You know, obviously not during the COVID when things were shut down, they weren't allowing fans. Um, they feature my music in in the in the games like every game. Uh, there's something that they use called trains, mm -hmm. which we kind of develop some new ones for them. Uh, the train they call it is just when when the when the offense or defense is on the court, you know, like that, and all that stuff. Well, there's one that when I was there performing the national anthem one time, the audio engineer said, "Man, I always wanted to ask you this. I don't know how you feel about it, but we have this thing. It's like boom, 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 boom." boom. Boom, 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 boom. what do you think it could do to that i'm like well patch me in let's let's try this and you know i laid down this riff and he's like that is perfect can can we use that i was like yeah go ahead you want to do another one yeah yeah how about this one you know and so i laid down a bunch of those just on the fly there in the in the uh, audio booth there at the arena and um they still use that that's that's the official 
go Spurs go chant that happens in game. And it's like, dang, 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 dang. like, even when I'm watching it with TV, you know, on the TV, you can still hear it, the in game audio. And even my son's like, there you are, daddy. You know? <laughs> that's, that's pretty, <laughs> other that's really pretty freaking one. cool, man. Really quick. Uh, my son at the time was probably three when I took him to a game that I was performing at. And I did the national anthem and he sat in the audience with, with uh, my wife and you know i know the presentation this time it was for me not Ginobili, of the national <laughs> anthem presented by chris box and at that time i don't think anybody had heard anybody call me and my son had never heard anybody call me anything other than daddy you know mommy calls me hey daddy you know and wants this and whatever so he thought that was so cool, Chris Boss. So after that, I, I went and joined him in the stands, you know, and watched like the second half. And then he's all three years old, Chris Boss. He kept going, Chris Boss. We're driving home <laughs> and he's in his car seat, Chris Boss. That he is comedy that gold. So cool. And every time for like two months, three months, when I was leave, leave for work, I'd have my guitar bag, right? I'd have my guitar on my shoulder and I'd, Oh, dad, are you going to go do Chris Boss? Can be Chris Boss? So, <laughs> yeah, tonight and tomorrow. And, yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, he, yeah, he, he thinks that every time I leave for work or thought that I was going to go do something on a grand scale like that, which I, I wish was true. But, yeah, he, he thought that was hilarious, and so did I. Wow. That is great. So, Chris, where can people find find information about you? And the music uh, so website, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so my site is a good place to start. It's just chrisboss.com, um, which will give you some links. You know, some of my music, um, our, our latest uh, single that we released, this Moon Chaser song, um, you can find it at he, chrisboss slash herenow.com. And the reason I offer that one is because it gives you options of where we, you'd like to download or stream or purchase from. So I okay. believe I may have sent you a link to that. You did. Um, I'm going to put it in our show description. Yeah. So. And, and uh, our buddy Alan here runs an internet radio show that likes. I run an internet radio station. That's true. All That's right. true. <laughs> that features new music. So oh, hey, hey, I know a guy. <laughs> Maybe I should introduce you to. <laughs> yeah, Hi, Chris. I'm Alan. <laughs> hey, I'm Chris. It's my buddy Jorge. <laughs> nice to meet you, Jorge. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> All right. Uh, Chris, we appreciate you coming on the show. Glad you brought Jorge with you. Uh, we really love the stories. Hang on a minute. I'm going to take us out of here. People, y'all know the drill. Go to agesofrock.com. Check out our social media links and our past episodes. And until next time, peace out. Thanks for listening to the Ages of Rock podcast. If you haven't done so already, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, like us on Facebook, and most importantly, tell all your friends. Remember, you're never too old to rock. Until the next episode, peace out, folks.